There you have a quick overview of what's new for service on 1983 cars and light trucks. And we're very pleased to have Gary Giebel with us. Gary is the 1981 national winner of the CTP competition. And as many of you have read, he's from Hawaii, where he works for Honolulu Ford. Welcome to Deerhorn, Gary. Thank you, Lil. Nice being here. This must be very exciting to be the uh, national CTP winner. What's, what's it been like for you? Well, it's been very exciting. Um, the wonderful trip to the Caribbean, and especially being here in Dearborn, seeing where all the cars are being manufactured. How did you prepare for the competition? Well, I really didn't do anything special. I studied all the CTP material, the TSDs, and the shop manuals as they come in. Do you think you'll get involved again next year? I sure will, and I'll be encouraging all of my fellow technicians at Home Ford to get involved, because nothing will make me happier than to have somebody else from Hawaii win the National Honor next year. <laughs> Thank you, Gary. As we said before, this is an interactive program, so we'd like you now to pick up your commander, and let's return to the menu. Sterling Heights, Michigan, where Gary is learning about the new transaxle and axles. First, Dan Ford on the five-speed manual transaxle. Dan, can you tell our audience what transaxle is this? Sure, Gary. Uh, this is a five-speed manual transaxle for 1983. What's the difference between this transaxle and the four-speed transaxle? The main difference, Gary, is that uh, we have a fifth gear, which is in constant mesh with our fourth gear. We also have fifth gear shaft with a pinion gear, which is in constant mesh with our ring gear, which is the output of the transaxle. We also have a new fifth gear fork and shift rail shaft. And also, in the selector plate, we have a fifth gear position, which is just rearward and on top of the fourth gear position. When the shift is made to fifth, the synchronizer locks the fifth gear to its shaft. Dan, can you show us the fifth gear power flow? Sure, Gary. Fifth gear power flow starts with the input cluster shaft to the fourth gear pinion, to the fifth gear, down through fifth gear shaft, to fifth gear pinion, to the ring gear, and then out to the wheels. Are there anything different about these bearings? Yeah, Gary. These are slip fit bearings on the main shaft and the fifth gear shaft. On the cluster shaft, they're all pressed bearings. Another new feature is a bias spring on the shift lever shaft. The spring holds the shift lever at the third and fourth gear slots of the shift plate when it's not being pulled over. It, this keeps the driver from going back in the second when he's looking for fourth. Looks like a really good transaxle. It certainly is. Thank you, Gary. What I have here is the differential case of the new five-speed transaxle. It's a two-piece, two-pinion aluminum case instead of iron. You can service the five-speed transaxle with the same tools as the four-speed MTX. Use the procedures in this 1983 Highlights book. The marquee and LTD cars for 1983 use suspension systems similar to the 1982 Granada and Cougar, but with gas-pressurized shock struts in front and gas-pressurized shock absorbers at the rear. Be sure to read the servicing precautions on the strut and in the booklet. Now, Al Lagasa, an axle service engineer, and Gary have some parts for the 1983 8.5-inch rear axle. What's new for 83 car axles? Well, Gary, for 1983, in the passenger car 8.5-inch ring gear, we have a new 30-tooth pinion gear and a new companion flange to go along with that gear. Is that all? That's all, Gary. Thanks, Al. Well, that's it for the 1983 car chassis highlights. Now, why not check yourself on some questions? Well, when you go out on vacation after the hour hours, what do you want to do? Are you in a surf border? No, I like to go backpacking. Uh, I love to enjoy nature. Oh, you take the family? Uh, one of my boys loves to do it. My son loves to surf. Well, there she is, Gary. What do you think? Wow, oh, it's beautiful. Let's go take a closer look at it. The factory-built convertible is back. Will they sell any of these soft top Mustangs in Honolulu, Gary? You bet. This convertible has factory-built reinforcements in the chassis, both front and rear, that are needed for support with the soft top. The quarter window cranks up and 
down and there are three adjustments for fit and ceiling on each window. The top mechanism is electro-hydraulic and the top has three adjustments for fit and seal on each side, plus two adjustments at the back on the linkage rails. We're not going to describe all the adjustments because of time. They're all covered clearly in the booklet. Gary just wanted to let you know this model is coming and where to find the service procedures. Hey, Gary, we've got more work to do. Just like my service manager. See you in the next frame. Aloha. Big news in gasoline engines is optional fuel injection for extra performance and electronic engine control for fuel economy and the meeting of emission standards. Gary, what's that you're holding? This is a fuel charging assembly with two injectors for central fuel injection. And this is a fuel charging manifold for a new electronic fuel injection for the 1.6 liter engine. Gary, let's be sure the audience knows how to distinguish between those two names. Central fuel injection and electronic fuel injection, starting with the 1983 models. CFI, or central fuel injection, refers to the EAT-3 system with injectors in the fuel charging body. And EFI, electronic fuel injection, now refers to the new system with individual injectors at each of the cylinder ports. And the new EEC-4 electronic engine control. For central fuel injection, the only EEC-3 car change is on the 3.8 liter V6 Continental. These changes put the exhaust gas oxygen sensor on the driver's side of the engine and the timing signal comes from a pickup in the distributor instead of a crankcase position sensor. And finally, there are two electric fuel pumps, one in the tank and one on the frame. This is a design aid room at the Ford Engineering Center in Dearborn, where engine compartments are designed and laid out. Let's look at some of the new features. The first EEC-4 fuel injection systems will be on the 1.6 liter engine. As we've seen, the four EAT-controlled injectors are installed in the fuel charging manifold near the cylinder ports. Airflow is controlled by a throttle body. And fuel flow is controlled by the fuel pump, the injectors, and the fuel pressure regulator. On top of the throttle body is an idle speed actuator, which is controlled by the electronic module. The electronic control uses this idle speed actuator to compensate for cold engine, AC loads, and other operating conditions. So it replaced the fast idle cam, throttle kicker, anti-dieseling solenoid, and other throttle position modulators. The device between the new air inlet and throttle body is a vane airflow sensor. It tells the electronic control what volume of air is going into the engine. It also contains a vane air temperature sensor to tell the electronic control to compensate for cold or warm inlet air. Fuel is supplied to the injectors by a high pressure electric pump mounted under the body outside the fuel tank. The fuel pressure regulator is new and is mounted on the fuel rail which brings fuel from the pump to the fuel charging manifold. Pressure regulation maintains a constant fuel pressure within the fuel charging manifold, reference to engine vacuum. Now, let's talk a little about the new electronic engine control 4 system. EEC-4 is a new electronic engine control system with eight sensor inputs and six control outputs. The module is mounted in the passenger compartment and doesn't look anything like the EEC-3 box. For the technician, there's a self-test connector under the hood. You can use a voltmeter or start tester, just like on MCU. And self-test codes are the same. The ignition system on the 1.6 liter EFI EEC-4 engine is a modification of the TFI ignition from 1982 with the module mounted on the distributor. All right, can you tell me the difference between this distributor and the TFI distributor? Sure, Gary, this new universal distributor has no mechanical centrifugal advance or vacuum advance unit and the signal to fire the module comes from the computer. 
And what's the reason for that funny looking rotor? That new multi-point rotor design requires no silicon grease and still reduces radio frequency interference noises. The EFI engine has a unique piston which gives a higher compression ratio, 9.5 to 1. And the cylinder head, cam, and tubular exhaust are common with the 1.6 liter high output engine. You'll find the complete story on the new EEC-4 fuel-injected 1.6-liter engine in this new Model Service Highlights book. And watch for an upcoming video disc on this subject. Now I believe Gary has a few parts to show us on the 1983 changes to the basic 1.6-liter engine. The spark plugs are new with a slightly longer reach. And under the carburetor primary part is an early fuel evaporation device a honeycomb grid heater that helps the fuel vaporize better while the intake is warming up. It is controlled by a temperature switch and relay, and the heater shuts off when the coolant warms up to 128 degrees. This deceleration fuel control module will be on all 1.6 liter engines with manual transaxles, except the fuel economy liter. This fuel economy feature was only on the base MTX models in 1982. However, on the 83 EFI with MTX, the EEC-4 module does the same thing by shutting off fuel during deceleration. The 1.6 liter and some other engines incorporate a bifurcated exhaust system. To improve performance, some engines utilize two dual bed catalytic converters and a Thermactor air tube feeding air to both cats. And I think that's it for car engines, right, Gary? That's right, Lowell. Now, don't forget to study the engine emissions booklet for more information on what we've covered, plus a few more details on applications of basic engines and controls. Now, try yourself on the following questions. For electrical and climate control, we have some new components and some new systems. First, there is an all-new anti-theft alarm system on Lincoln Continental. The electronic controller module is installed under the package tray or above the glove box. With the ignition off, the system is armed by locking and closing the door. Opening the door or trunk with the key won't set the alarm off. But if the trunk lock is punched out, or if a door is opened without the key, the alarm will be triggered. There are two alarms and a safety. The lights flash, the horn blows, and the starter circuit is disabled until the system is reset. This is the new cooling fan control for 1.6 liter engines with air conditioning. It's an electronic module which replaces the AC relay and cooling fan relay used on 81 and 82 cars. And it's located up behind the glove box. The AC clutch is wired from the pressure cycling switch through the module and functions the same as in past years. This is a new fuel economy feature on several cars and some light trucks with manual transmission. It's a module which triggers an upshift indicator light. Light in the instrument panel comes on, indicating the best time to upshift. On some cars, there's an electric solenoid for the fuel filler door. It works from a button in the glove box. Here's a new Tecumseh compressor. This compressor is a four-cylinder radial piston design. It's completely sealed. You don't overhaul it. The shaft seal and a clutch are replaceable using these special tools. The new compressor is used with a larger 5-8 inch spring lock coupling. They go together and come apart just like 3-8 and half inch couplings. But a new tool is required. The liquid line in the 1.6 liter air conditioning system is redesigned for 1983. In 82, the orifice tube was located in the jumper tube near the evaporator inlet. For 1983, the jumper tube is an integral part of the line and the orifice tube is located at the condenser end. Well, that concludes our section on electrical and climate control. Read the booklet for more information and check yourself with the questions that follow.
This is the design aid room in Building 1 at Ford's Engineering Center, where truck engine compartments are designed and laid out. And this is the big news in light truck engines, the 2.2-liter four-cylinder diesel, which will be an option on Ranger. And a 6.9-liter V8 diesel will be optional on the E and F series. Diesels, as you probably know, don't use carburetors or electric spark. The pistons compress air, which heats up when it compresses. Fuel is then injected through nozzles into the air near top dead center on the compression stroke. And the fuel immediately ignites from heat of compression. The fuel is pumped under pressure and the ignition is timed by a rotary injection pump, which also contains the governor. Both engines use glow plugs to preheat the cylinders for easier cold starting. Are there any special tools for this engine? There are the special tools, but the important thing to note is that the bolts and threads on this engine are a mixture of metric, English, and U.S. Obviously, there's a lot of new service information to absorb. Be sure to study the diesel engine booklets and watch for an upcoming video disc on the 2.2 diesel service highlights. There are just a couple of items to mention for gasoline engines on light trucks. This is a model 2150 feedback carburetor. It will be on the eight-cylinder truck with E3, and it uses an air bleed control with a solenoid similar to the YFA feedback. And a knock sensor will be added to the MCU system on some 4.9-liter six-cylinder engines. Also for 1983 light trucks, the 4.2-liter and 6.6-liter gasoline engines will no longer be used. See the engine highlights booklet for more details. Now, let's look at some of the light truck chassis highlights. This is the automatic overdrive transmission with the 4.9-liter truck engine. And this is Ed Reppin, design engineer for the automatic overdrive transmission. Thank you, Gary. Ed, can you tell me what's unique about this application? Well, 1983, the uh, automatic overdrive transmission will be offered as an optional transmission on the 4.9 liter light truck engine. And what's unique about this application is that the throttle valve control system is operated by a throttle valve or TV cable between the carburetor and transmission. Ed, is there an adjustment on this cable? Well, adjustment is done here at this mechanism at the carburetor and the adjustment is just as critical as the other AODs in that if it is out adjustment, we will have poor shift quality and timing resulting from uh, resulting in customer complaints and possibly transmission damage. Can you show me how to adjust the cable? Yes, Gary, it's quite simple. First, check and uh, adjust your engine idle speed to specification if necessary, then shut off your engine and leave the shift selector in neutral. Then at the carburetor, unlock the cable by pushing up on this locking tab from underneath, applying it up the rest of the way. The cable is now unlocked. Now at the transmission, it is necessary to hold the TV lever back at idle with a firm force approximately 10 pounds. This can best be done by hooking up two TV return springs from passenger car as such. cable is now held back at idle. And back at the carburetor, make sure the choke is off the fast idle cam and the throttle lever is at the anti-diesel stop. Then push in this locking tab firmly until it is flush. And at the transmission, return, remove these two springs. The cable is now adjusted. Wasn't that simple, Gary? Thanks very much, Ed. Now, let's look at the Ranger features. There are new 5-speed and 4-speed transmissions for different engines and drivetrain combinations. They're all covered in the Ranger Transmission Highlights book. Next, the Ranger 4-wheel drive option uses a Borg Warner 1350 transfer case and a Dana Model 28 front driving axle. This is Ben Candela. He's a design engineer for this new Ranger transfer case. Thanks, Gary. 
1983 Ranger transfer case is a Warner Gear two-speed part-time transfer case. It's similar to our 82 F-Series, except it's more compact and it weighs 21 pounds lighter. It's very similar to the F-Series transfer case, except that it has some new unique features. Can you point out some of these features? The first one, Gary, is the front output has been angled toward the front drive axle pinion yoke. A second feature is the planet gears. They've been changed from spur gears to helical gears. And a third feature is the external shift mount control assembly. Can you tell us how it works? Yes. Currently, the lever is in the too high shift position. In this position, by turning the input, you are driving straight through the transfer case and you are driving the rear tires. By shifting to the four high position, you engage the mode fork, which then, dri driving through the chain, drives all four tires in high speed. By pulling the lever out toward you, the driver, and rearward, you engage four wheel low. And now you're driving all four tires at a ratio of 2.48 to 1. Thanks very much, Ben. Thanks, Gary. Next is this M28 axle. It is similar to the Model 44 on F-Series. It uses a collapsible spacer to set pinion bearing preload and has Warner locking hubs. There are also some additional new tools needed for servicing the axle. Front driving axles on all light trucks are going to have a slip yoke boot in 1983, which requires a special tool to install the clamp. Al, what do you have there? Well, Gary, this is the 1983 Ranger 373 to 1 ratio gear set. This is a 1982 308 to 1 gear set. N notice the difference speaks for an interesting change in service. What the what, so, 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 thing about it? Well, the thickness of the ring gear, you cannot get at the pinion shaft out from the axle shaft. Cut a special relief area in the Rotate the shaft.